The year 1997 brought us a lot of great things. In the world of television, we were first introduced to South Park and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. In music, the Spice Girls were top of the charts. And in the WWF, the year was very much split in two halves. On screen, the company was going through arguably their best year ever creatively, with some of their greatest storylines starting to develop and a number of major stars rising to the forefront. Off screen, however, things would not be so rosy as, with WCW continuing to beat them in the ratings war, Vince McMahon's company would come closer than it ever had to going out of business. So join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in the WWF in 1997, A Year in Review. When we last left off, Psycho Sid was the WWF champion, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels' personal war was continuing to boil, and despite being portrayed as the ultimate heel, Stone Cold Steve Austin was growing in fan popularity every week. And all these events would lead to the first pay-per-view of the year, the Royal Rumble. But before we would get there, Vince McMahon, still trying to catch the eyes of new fans to his product, would start another new show on January 4th of this year, one that featured an edgier product than normal and would air from a different New York location live every week, Shotgun Saturday Night. And while this show would never reach the heights of Raw when it came to popularity, it would be a further indicator of the new direction the company was headed in, one which would see them present themselves with a lot more attitude, something which would certainly be on display when the time for the Rumble came on January 19th, as while on the undercard, Hunter Hearst Helmsley would retain his Intercontinental title against Goldust and Ahmed Johnson would get some revenge over his newest rival, Farouk, the world title match would see Shawn Michaels return in front of a hometown Texas crowd to finally get the better of Sid, pinning him in just under 14 minutes to start his second reign on top. Meanwhile though, the Rumble match itself would see things end far less decisively as, after entering at number 5, Steve Austin would last all the way up until the end before he was eliminated by his chief rival Bret Hart. That said, the referees would not catch this elimination, so, in true heel fashion, Austin simply climbed back in the ring and dumped out the remaining three entrants, The Undertaker, Vader, and the Hitman himself, picking up the win from there in another moment that was supposed to get him over as a heel, but ended up causing fans to love him even more. But of course, with such a screwy victory, on-screen WWF President Gorilla Monsoon was never going to allow the Rattlesnake a main event spot at WrestleMania, and so would instead book him and the three men he illegally eliminated into a fatal four-way match at the next pay-per-view of the year, where the winner would go on to face Shawn Michaels on the grandest stage of them all. Before that could happen though, HBK would infamously lose his smile after a knee injury caused him to vacate the title something which many people behind the scenes, Bret Hart included, believed was being done so he wouldn't have to drop the belt to the hitman at the big show. Yes, the plan had been for the two rivals to face off again in a rematch from WrestleMania 12, but with Shawn allegedly embellishing how bad his injury was, this would have to wait for the time being. Instead, the fatal four-way match at In Your House 13 Final Four on February 16th would be for the now vacant WWF title, as in that bout, Austin, Hart, Undertaker, and Vader would all fight for the right to be named champion. And after 24 minutes and 6 seconds, it would be the Hitman who would come out the victor, making him a four-time world champion in the process. Elsewhere, meanwhile, other notable news would see Rocky Maivia successfully defend the Intercontinental title he'd won from Hunter Hearst Helmsley on Raw just three days earlier, and Owen Hart and the British Bulldog managed to keep hold of their tag team titles when facing off against Doug Furness and Phil LaFon. But really though, it was the world title picture people were really interested in, because the very next night on Raw, Psycho Sid would get his promised rematch for the belt when he took on the new champion Hart one-on-one. -on -one. And in that match, after some interference from everyone's favorite outlaw, Stone Cold, Sid would actually be able to win the belt, starting his second reign with the title. And of course, all this controversy would lead to the upcoming WrestleMania 13, but before we got there, another new champion would be crowned when, on the February 26th episode of Raw, the British Bulldog would defeat his partner Owen Hart in the finals of a tournament to crown the inaugural European Champion. As for his brother-in-law Brett though, well, he was having a much worse time as, with fan support for Steve Austin continuing to grow, he would start to let his frustrations out on everyone around him, at one point famously throwing down Vince McMahon and calling the whole situation bullshit on live TV. 
So it was clear then that in order to regain control of his legacy, the hitman would have to not only defeat Austin, but show how much of a fraud he really was by forcing him to tap out. And this would lead to WrestleMania 13 on March 23rd where, in probably the greatest wrestling match of all time, the two would face off again, this time with the rule being that the only way to win was via submission. After a bloody war that lasted just over 22 minutes, however, Austin, unable to deal with both the pain of being locked in the sharpshooter and the extreme loss of blood he'd undergone, would pass out, forcing the special guest referee, UFC star Ken Shamrock, to call the bout for the hitman. But in refusing to quit, Austin had endeared himself towards the Chicago crowd so much that it would cause Brett to attack him further after the bell rang, as from there, the two would switch alignments, with Austin now playing the face and Hart playing the heel. And this would end up being the highlight of a fairly weak card as it happened because, elsewhere, unable to live up to the five-star classic that Austin and Brett had put on, things would be filled out with Rocky Maivia defending his intercontinental title against the Sultan, and an admittedly fun Chicago street fight that saw Ahmed Johnson and the Legion of Doom defeat Farouk's Nation of Domination. Then in the main event, The Undertaker and Sid would quite literally stink out the joint when after allegedly soiling himself towards the end of the bout, Sid would fall to the dead man as he became the WWF Champion for the second time. And this would see Paul Bearer try to weasel his way back into the new champ's good graces in the weeks that followed as, now desperate to be the manager of the top guy in the company, he attempted to blackmail Taker, telling him that if he didn't play ball, then he would reveal his most shameful secret to the world. Initially though, The Undertaker would fight back against this, taking on and defeating Bearer's hand-picked challenger Mankind at the next pay-per-view of the year, April 20th's In Your House 14, Revenge of the Taker. But that wouldn't be the only big story going into that show as, after solidifying his heel turn, but only in America, Bret Hart would reform the Hart Foundation, now made up of himself, Owen Hart, the British Bulldog, Jim Neidhart, and Brian Pillman. And this would lead to a unique situation where, still being treated like heroes in their native Canada, the Hearts would force the company to shift the heel-face dynamic depending on what country they were in that week, with even Steve Austin serving as a villain going forward whenever he dared face off against the hitman north of the border. On the night of In Your House 14 though, the Rattlesnake would remain firmly in the babyface as, in the rubber match between him and Brett, he would end up picking up the disqualification win, with this making him the new number one contender to the Phenom's world title. And that match would eventually come at In Your House 15, a cold day in hell, on May 11th as it happened. Before this though, a few things would change for Austin's chief rivals as, on the April 28th episode of Raw, Owen Hart would pick up singles gold of his own when he beat Rocky Maivia to win the Intercontinental title. So with the stable now holding the IC, European, and tag team straps, they'd do their best to get inside the Rattlesnake's head during his first big title shot. And ultimately, they'd be successful in this as, come the end of the bout, after a well-placed distraction from Brett, the dead man would be able to pick up the win. But of course, that wasn't the only noteworthy thing that happened that night as, prior to this, Ken Shamrock would formally make the jump over from UFC when he had his first official WWF match against Vader, a bloody and stiff battle that saw the Mastodon suffer a legitimate broken nose by the end. Yes, Shamrock was clearly keen to make an impact as quickly as possible, but as he was continuing to rise up the ranks in the weeks that followed, another big name would make their return when Shawn Michaels, now apparently having recovered from the injury which forced him to retire earlier in the year, came back to the ring to team up with the enemy of his enemy, Stone Cold Steve Austin, as together they took on Owen Hart and the British Bulldog for the tag team titles. And on the May 26th episode of Raw, they'd even be able to defeat the two heels, from there continuing an uneasy alliance which saw each hesitant to trust the other, even if both still had a bone to pick with the hitman. But of course, while Austin and Brett's rivalry was all kayfabe, HBK's beef with the Canadian was far more real, with the two repeatedly taking shots at each other in promos around this time, and even at one point getting into a legit backstage fight. And this was supposed to climax on screen at the June 8th King of the Ring when Hart vs. Michaels 2 was finally set to take place. That was, of course, all up until an injury picked up by the Hitman forced plans to be changed at the last minute. And those new plans, as it happened, would see the tag team champions face off against each other, with them here hoping to determine who the team captain going forward would be. Ultimately though, the match would end in a no contest, leaving little settled between the warring partners, something which came much to the delight of the hearts. 
And that wouldn't be the only reason for them to be happy as, on that same night, they'd defeat Psycho Sid and the Legion of Doom in a six-man tag, all while elsewhere, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, who had by now added a bodyguard in the form of China to his act, finally got to become King of the Ring. Then in the main event of the night, The Undertaker, who had since acquiesced to Paul Bearer's demands and allowed him to manage him, would successfully defend his WWF title against Farouk. Soon after this, though, the dead man would finally reach his limit with his manager and would give him the boot, forcing Bearer to reveal his dreaded secret to the world. Kane, his long-lost brother, was still alive and had not died in the same fire that killed their parents so many years ago. What's more, Bearer claimed, it had been The Undertaker himself who started that fire, something which the dead man denied. Still though, the threat of his sibling continuing to lurk in the background would get in his head as he defended his WWF title against Vader at July 6th's In Your House 16 Canadian Stampede, with him there only barely being able to retain. But that wasn't the biggest match on this show as, in the main event of one of the company's greatest pay-per-views ever, the Hart Foundation would come out to a rapturous home country response as they took on and defeated the alliance of Steve Austin, Ken Shamrock, Goldust, and the Legion of Doom, with Owen ultimately getting the pinfall over Austin at the end of the match. And this would cause the Rattlesnake to then spin off into a program with the youngest Hart, all while his tag team partner Shawn Michaels would be forced to vacate another belt due to injury, leading to Austin finding a new teammate in Mick Foley's latest creation, Dude Love. Yes, despite being known to WWF fans prior to this as Mankind, it would be the second face of Foley that was able to gain the respect of the Texan, as from there, they would team together as champions, holding on to these belts throughout the summer, as meanwhile, in the WWF title picture, Bret Hart would prepare to face off against The Undertaker at the upcoming SummerSlam. But what made this one even more interesting was that Shawn Michaels would act as the special guest referee with the stipulation being that if he in any way attempted to screw the hitman, he'd be banned from wrestling in America from there on in. So in the end, HBK played ball, counting the winning pinfall for his rival after accidentally hitting the dead man with a steel chair towards the close of the bout, something which caused him great pains both in character and in real life, as the last thing he wanted was for Brett to become champion again. Elsewhere, meanwhile, Mick Foley would morph back into Mankind to defeat Hunter Hearst Helmsley in a steel cage match, the British Bulldog would defend his European Championship against Ken Shamrock, and disaster would strike when, in the Intercontinental title match between Steve Austin and Owen Hart, a botched pile driver would lead to the Rattlesnake being temporarily paralyzed. Luckily, however, he would be able to recover enough feeling in his limbs to win both the match and the title, but after being taken to the hospital following the bout, he'd be diagnosed with a broken neck, something which would leave him unable to compete for the foreseeable future. But this would only get him more over as it happened, as now waging war against management themselves for forcing him to vacate both his Intercontinental and Tag Team titles, Austin would deliver stunners to every authority figure in his path week in and week out, with fans patiently waiting for the point where, eventually, Vince McMahon himself would be on the receiving end. Before that happened though, the next big show of the year, Ground Zero in your house, would take place on September 7th where, while in the undercard Brian Pillman would face off against Goldust in an indecent proposal match and the Headbangers would win the vacant tag team titles, the main events would see Bret Hart successfully defend the WWF title against the Patriot, all well, after that, Shawn Michaels would be forced to reckon with the man who he'd inadvertently laid out the months prior, The Undertaker. And to help him with this, HBK had begun aligning himself with his real-life click buddy Hunter Hearst Helmsley as, alongside China and Rick Rude, they would go on to form D-Generation X, an outlaw group of heels who broke the rules at every turn, both on screen and off. So there at ringside during their stablemates bout with the dead man then, they'd continually get involved, leading to the whole thing eventually getting deemed a no contest. But of course, there would have to be a winner eventually, so in an effort to make sure this happened, the two would meet again the following month in a brand new type of match altogether. Before we would get there though, WWF's fortunes would start to change, as after having struggled so much financially throughout 1997 that they found themselves on the verge of bankruptcy, Vince McMahon would finally get a run of good luck when, after raising the price of his In Your House shows to match that of the Big Five pay-per-views, the company would get an influx of money 
something which, combined with their slowly growing ratings, was enough to keep them on the air on the USA Network and stop the boss from having to downsize to the regional Northeast promotion that he'd already started making plans for. As well as that, it also meant that McMahon could afford to pay for Bret Hart's large contract again, something which he'd told the hitman in the months prior he could no longer honor. As a result of this, though, Bret had already started negotiations with WCW, with a deal to sign him up ultimately being finalized soon after. But now wanting to keep his champion on the books, the boss asked Hart if he could get out of this, with him only then realizing the problem he'd created for himself. Yes, the hitman was still the WWF champion and, as part of his contract, had reasonable creative control over his final 30 days with the company, something which would cause a major issue come the time of Survivor Series. Prior to this, however, the September 22nd episode of Raw would see Steve Austin finally deliver a long-awaited stunner to Vince McMahon, teasing the legendary feud between them that was to come, and the third face of Foley, Cactus Jack, make his WWF debut to defeat Hunter Hearst Helmsley. But that wasn't all that happened that week, as just two days prior, the company would venture across the pond again when, at the UK-only show One Night Only, Shawn Michaels would court even more controversy when he used his backstage sway to win the European title from the British Bulldog right in front of his dying sister in the crowd. Yes, it was another example of HBK playing up to his reputation as a jackass, but come the time for October 5th's Bad Blood in your house, he would finally get his just desserts when he faced off against The Undertaker in the first ever Hell in a Cell match, leaving him with no opportunity to escape or to get his DX friends involved. So it should come as no surprise then that this one left the European champ brutalized come the end, with him only getting the win after, to the surprise of everyone, Kane finally made his debut at the close of the bout to rip the door off the cage and lay his brother out with a tombstone pile driver. But aside from having one of the greatest matches in WWF history, Bad Blood would also be memorable for tragic reasons, as prior to the show that night, Brian Pillman was found dead in his hotel room. Aside from this, other noteworthy moments would see Owen Hart win the vacant Intercontinental title and The Rock team with his new stable of the Nation of Domination to take on the Legion of Doom in a handicap match. Yes, after undergoing a vicious backlash from fans, Rocky Maivia had turned heel and morphed into the man who would one day go on to conquer Hollywood. But that wouldn't be the big story going into Survivor Series on November 9th, as at an event that saw Kane make his in-ring debut by destroying Mankind and Steve Austin finally return from injury to defeat Owen Hart for the Intercontinental title again, everyone would instead be talking about the fact that, after beating The Undertaker inside of Hell in a Cell, Shawn Michaels was finally the number one contender to Bret Hart's WWF title and that the match would be set for this very show. Now, the Montreal Screwjob is too big of a story to get fully into here, but in short, this would be the night that, after Bret Hart had refused to drop the belt to HBK in his home country of Canada as per the creative control clause in his contract, Vince McMahon and a select few others set out to make it appear as though he tapped out at the close of the belt, visually screwing him and making Michaels the new champion instead. After this then, Brett would trash the ringside area while all of the Hart family, minus Owen, would quit the company in disgust. Meanwhile, the next night on Raw, Vince McMahon would do a sit-down interview with Jim Ross where, sporting the black eye the hitman had given him the night before, he'd tell the world that Brett screwed Brett, effectively giving birth to the Mr. McMahon character right there, even if, at the time, he still truly believed he was the babyface in the situation. And while who was ultimately right or wrong has been a subject of debate in the years since, fans had little time to digest it at the time as WWF would push on forward with their final show of the year, The Generation X In Your House, on December 7th, where the key undercard matches saw Takamichi Noku defeat Brian Christopher to become the inaugural light heavyweight champion, the New Age Outlaws successfully defend the tag team titles they'd won on a recent episode of Raw, and Jeff Jarrett get a win over The Undertaker after Kane, who was still trying to convince his brother to face him one-on-one, -on -one, interfered and cost him the bout. As well as this, in the main events, Steve Austin would beat The Rock in the first teaser to a rivalry that would go on to define a generation, all while Shawn Michaels would defend the WWF title against Ken Shamrock, only to then be attacked by a returning Owen Hart at the close of the show. Yes, it seemed like the King of Hearts was back to avenge his family, but while he would get a shot at the title his brother had been screwed out of, HBK would once again use his political power to have this happen on a throwaway episode of Raw instead of the pay-per-view it deserved. 
As well as this, unwilling to drop the European title in an actual match, he and Triple H would make a mockery of it when, in a comedy encounter, Sean laid down in the middle of the ring and gifted it to his stablemate on the December 22nd episode of Raw. But that wasn't the only title change that would happen in December, as Steve Austin would have vacated the Intercontinental Championship to The Rock just two weeks prior, with him reasoning that he had bigger fish to fry. Yes, while this represented the end of 1997, 1998 was about to see things blow up in ways it hadn't since the days of Hulk Hogan, as with Stone Cold now going after the WWF title, The Rock having morphed into his final form, The Undertaker in Kane's War getting started, and the Mr. McMahon character being born, the Attitude Era was truly about to begin. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.